Things progressed rather quickly after the end of the orientation. In fact, a lot of things seemed to have been expedited for the sake of getting us out of the Dunning Hall and into our dorms as quickly as possible, all without actually saying it, of course. The lights around us slowly dimmed after the first few courses of food were served, and as the desserts finally came through, so too did these individualised letters, arriving on similarly posh silver platters. Each letter was sealed in an envelope that was custom made for each of us, with different colours, designs, and even a custom wax seal that I'd only seen on period dramas and movies. My letter, however, was particularly bland, a starch white paper that was devoid of any detailing or embellishments, save for my name written on it in stunning cursive, and capped off with a plain, unmarked wax seal. Thasia seemed to have taken notice of my hesitation with the letter, as everyone else had already started unsealing them and reading the contents within. Do not think much of the lack of sigils and regalia, Emma. You're a new Roma, so a lack of any identifying markings is to be expected. With time, as the Academy learns more about you, your customs, your people and your house, I'm more than certain that you will find such official correspondences to be tailored to fit your personal honour. The avian attempted to reassure me, completely missing the point, but much to her credit reinforcing my assumptions of the Academy. This place wanted to extract as much intel out of me as I was planning to do from it. Things were bound to evolve into an interesting game of cat and mouse, but first, I wanted to see what awaited me inside of this mystery envelope. After unsealing the wax, I was met with a high-quality parchment, with what I assumed was the Academy's insignia at his header, two keys crossed diagonally with a wand and a book, superimposed in the middle, mimicking the titular medieval heraldry of a sword and shield. Within the letter were the contents of the entire orientation, summed up in a mini-syllabus, which puzzled me as there didn't seem to be any new information within the lone piece of A4 parchment. That was, until my finger had traced down to the bottom of the letter, at which point the meticulously crafted calligraphy of the page suddenly melted. Localized source of mana radiation detected. 200% above background radiation levels. The text that had been written in what I assumed was ink simply dematerialized, then melted, before reforming into new letters and words like an unnecessarily complicated slide transition on a PowerPoint presentation, eventually forming an entirely new page of information. Heh. <laughs> Surprised, Air Frauma? I don't know, Sully piped up after noticing my extended staring. I didn't know how else he would have gauged my reaction given the helmet, so this was more than likely just a provocation made out of spite or some underlying prejudice. I half expected this, though, given his attitude from before. What about? I snapped back, too tired to argue, but also too annoyed to really let that comment slide. You know, I understand the desire to save face, I really do. But you don't really need to do so in front of us. We're your peer group after all, and it's important for us to know what you have and what you lack in your realm. New realm was generally more primitive in their predispositions. Seeing text move across parchment must be new to you. Indeed, seeing the written word at all must be an entirely new concept for most of your kind for sure. The diminutive lizard spoke with that same inflated sense of self-worth and ego. One that I couldn't help but to narrow my eyes at despite knowing it wouldn't be picked up by anyone around me let alone the lizard. It was at this point that I had a choice to make. I either ignored the discount code board and continued on reading, or I smacked him upside the head with my data tap just to show him just what moving text actually looked like. The latter would have been quite effective too, given the fact that I was assigned a mil-spec data tap. So unlike most tablets in the commercial market that prioritise sleekness, thinness and style, all the while sacrificing resilience, Millspec tablets still very much resemble the bulky electronic hardware of the 28th, 25th, 23rd, heck, even the early 21st century. It was designed with ruggedness and survivability in mind, so I knew that smacking the lizard upside the head with it would certainly do more damage to him than the tablet itself. I decided on a compromise, however. As I wordlessly grabbed my tablet from my belt, turned it towards the lizard, I began scrolling through some of the open tabs I had, making sure the screen was set to maximum brightness on light mode, and to scroll as fast as possible as tens of pages flew by with each flick of my finger. I only did this for a short moment to prove my point of course, but the reaction I garnered from Eleanor was nothing short of worth it. His mouth hung agape, his pupils constricted from the blinding light, as his whole body seemed to tense as he tried to speak, but found himself unable to do so. Stuttered words emerged from his gaping maw, but all of them were quickly shushed by the likes of Thaumin, 
who seemed more annoyed by the Lissa's antics than anything. But, but the air from they, that, what, what was, that's not, they're not supposed to have. What? Just spit it out or I'll bite you, Thawing growled, as he and Thasia seemed to be too preoccupied with the contents of their own letters to have paid my little interaction with Illinor any mind. After recovering from that brief exchange with a triumphant chuckle underneath my helmet, I began combing through the letter for all the unspoken announcements alluded to during the orientation. What was highlighted above all else, however, were three quite understandably important topics. Dormitory assignment, Dragon's Heart Tower, level 23, residence 30. Weapons inspection, conducted by school blacksmith and armorer, Professor Rowan Hart, at the Northfield Proving Grounds, by the stroke of midnight tomorrow. House assignments, conducted by Professor Altalan, Ru Astor, Professor Vanavan, and Professor Maltori. Location to be determined. No preparations required. Details will be posted to your dorms on the fourth day of the grace period. Both the weapon inspections and the house assignments worry me greatly. The former was tricky, as on one hand it could be a solid show of force for humanity, which seemed to be sorely needed in an academy clearly designed to force the upper echelons of the other realms to bend the knee. However, on the other hand it could lead to unforeseen consequences, most concerning of which was losing the element of surprise in the case I needed to use it, or worse yet, outright technological theft. I'd have to sleep on it, but suffice it to say, even though my pistol was relatively obsolete by modern standards, it was still leagues beyond whatever this place had. The latter announcement on house assignments, however, was a complete mystery, and whilst it gave me bad vibes, I knew I'd have to rely on the likes of Thacer and Thalmin to fill me in on what to expect. It was clear they had prior knowledge of academy life, so they'd be a vital resource to rely on. I'd worry about that later. The other details listed in the letter were rather mundane, and relatively benign. School supply procurements, uniform tailoring, as well as other assorted details including the schedule for the first semester and the names and offices of all professors assigned to Year 1 students. To be honest, I was getting tired by this point as the only thing keeping me up was the latent effects of adrenaline coursing from my veins. It was clear everyone else at the table shared a similar sentiment as yawns and half-litted eyes abounded all around me. And this prompted someone to finally mention the possibility of retiring for the night. Well, if there isn't anything else we have to do, let's get moving. We have a new home to look forward to. And we still have to decide on sleeping arrangements, Thurman spoke, taking charge as he stood up. Eleanor followed suit as he glanced towards Thacia. Let's just hope our dorm is one of the free bedroom variety and not two, because I'd hate to force anyone here to room with our tainted princess, he spoke, in a surprisingly calm manner which really clued me in as to how he perceived Thacia. If he could discriminate this passively, then the whole taint discrimination must really run deep. Even you, Avrama. He turned towards me. As much as I find your presence aggravating, I'd rather a quick and proper death than one by inadvertent and unexpected tank consumption. I ignored the discount kobold once again, as all four of us finally made our way out of the Grand Hall and out into the castle proper. En route to the dorms. The journey up and towards the dorms was one that I'd definitely need the suit's footage for a deeper analysis later on. There was no way I could remember every twist and turn, every hallway and corridor, every stairway and stairwell, every side passage and connecting room that led us to where we found ourselves now. Indeed, I wasn't surprised that Eleanor had practically begged me to carry him the rest of the way, as his little lizard legs were clearly not built for scaling the lengths and heights of this veritable castle of a school. I refused to oblige, of course. Until suddenly, the comparatively small thing all but gave up on walking, which forced me to bridle carry him the rest of the way towards the dorms. Instead of being happy with the service I'd fully offered him, however, he started to wheeze and whine with even more, stirring up my already frayed nerves like a child poking at a big cat enclosure at a zoo. He wasn't satisfied with the way I was carrying him, for in his own words, being carried like a sack of potatoes wasn't becoming of a noble and bean of his standing. I told him I couldn't give less of a crap about his standing, and that his little legs barely gave him anything to stand on. The lizard, however, refused to listen, and instead took it upon himself to rectify this injustice without a chance for me to argue. He scurried up and around my arms, scanning me like some sort of an unruly house cat before finding himself perched up on my shoulders. 
However, instead of draping himself across him like a scarf, the way my cat usually did, he instead decided to ride me like some glorified jockey, with his legs dangling from my shoulders and his arms fully clinched up against the chin of my helmet. I would have been worried about the helmet slipping off if it wasn't for the three layered hermetic seal and madlocks, which kept it tightly affixed to the rest of my armour. The whole affair was somewhat demeaning, and kind of humiliating when you looked at it from an outsider's perspective, but I really couldn't care less at the point. I was tired, and at least this kept the lizard's mouth shut as we made our final approach towards our door. Even Thacia and Thalman refused to comment, either out of pity for the lizard or out of respect for me having to deal with him. Dragon's Heart Tower, Level 23, Residence 30 I didn't know what I was expecting with the accommodations. To be honest, that was the last thing on my mind given the non-stop barrage of stressful circumstances that had come to dominate the majority of my evening. A part of me was excited for it though. It was the same intrusive part of my mind that still wanted to see this place for what it clearly wasn't, a fantasy. Images conjured up from years of hyperfixations on novels, detailing the fantastical accommodations in magically inclined schools, certainly didn't help matters. As a former college student, I didn't have high hopes for dorm life. As an academy student, however, the possibilities were endless. Any and all expectations were thrown completely out the window as the double doors opened, revealing a room that immediately struck me as a design pulled straight out of a five-star suite in some heritage building dating back to pre-20th century vintage. The double doors gave way to a small hallway, which opened up to a living room for maybe even five times the size of my aunt's New York City apartment in the heart of the Acela Corridor. Windows that looked more at home in a cathedral dominated the majority of the living space, which was otherwise centred around a fireplace that roared to life as soon as the doors behind us closed shut. A series of sofas, lounge chairs, bookcases and coffee tables adorned the oak, timber and granite tile floors. This complemented what I could only describe as a mix of wood frame wall panels with white accents that felt somewhat precarious when considering that the fireplace ever so often emitted embers that floated high up to the roof. That was another thing I needed to mention right off the bat. The fucking ceilings. Most apartments in the Acela Corridor, the combined megacity that was New York, New Jersey, Boston, Washington DC and Baltimore, had a maximum ceiling height of about 9 feet. You'd be lucky to find a place with ceilings that high in fact, but my aunt was lucky enough to have inherited a legacy apartment, dating back to the late 21st century. The ceiling in this dormitory? It went up a good 14, maybe even 20 feet. It actually sort of angled inwards towards a rectangular point, which is more than likely the underside of a roof, meaning we were at the very top floor of one of the castle's towers. The ceiling tapered up towards these open wood frame support beams and struts that back on earth could have housed an entire colony of pigeons. Indeed, my overactive imagination conjured up thoughts of Thacia perching upon it given her avian form, a thought which would have made me chuckle wildly if not for how awestruck I was from the grandeur of this place. Yet as stunned and in awe as I was, the rest of my peers seemed to walk right through the space without paying much mind, as if it was just another room to them. What a damp, Eleanor muttered under his breath, scampering off of my shoulders and back onto his feet, which surprised me not because he considered this place anything but utterly mind-blowing, but because he still found it in him to fucking complain, even after everything we'd been through. Furnishings and quarters more fit for a minor lord or a knight. Say, this would more than likely be what you're used to, right, Emma, of Erfram? Thalman spoke with that same gruff tone of voice. It was clear, however, he was still attempting to play nice, so I responded with the only thing my awestruck self could do at that point. I shrugged. How are you finding the quarters, princess? Are they to your liking? Thurman quickly turned to face Thacia, who seemed to be analysing the place with those piercing eyes of hers. Her hand ran across some of the furnishings as she pinched her fingers together at the slightest bit of dust. I am partial towards anything the Academy wishes to provide us, the avian answered diplomatically. Oh, come on, answer truthfully, princess, the Lupinor egged her on for a less guarded response. If I am to be blunt about it, this place is sorely lacking in amenities as it is in size and design. A hallway leading into a rectangular living quarters, with only two bedrooms flanking the hallway near the entrance, you're right in your presumptions, Prince Salmon. These quarters seem to be quite suited for an individual of knightly status, 
or perhaps even a minor lordship? Thacia responded with sincerity, the remaining tactful in her tone and delivery. No dining room? Eleanor mumbled out, as he splayed across one of the couches. Again, reminding me of a sport feline. My points exactly, Thacia responded, while I stared at all of them with an unbreaking expression of utter disbelief. All right, enough room talk, I think there's something I need cleared up, I interjected, finally breaking through my all-stock gawking with a renewed sense of direction. Yes, Emma? Thacia replied promptly. You said we'd talk about this when we got somewhere less public, so spill it. I want to know what was up with the academic rights thing. I want to know why today's ceremony was such a big shock to you all. I want to know what the hell is up with everything. I laid out my questions, to which Thaisa and Thamin probably nodded in response. I appreciate your patience in maintaining discretion for so long, Emma. An answer is the least we can do to reciprocate your tactfulness in handling what must be a very confusing set of circumstances, Thaisa began. I'll explain it simply, Erframa, Thamin interjected, as if to take the burden of explanation off of Thacia, as it was clear her response was going to be long-winded. What usually happens on the night of arrival is an orientation, not the academic rights ceremony. And that's why everyone was so surprised. That's why everyone was caught off guard. We had no time to prepare for it, but there were rumours that this year would have been exceptional, so some of us were prepared. The Lupinor lifted up his ceremonial dagger, pointing at the gem which encrusted the hilt of the blade. Thasia did the same, revealing her necklace and amulet, whilst Eleanor lazily raised his stubby little arm and pointed at his bracelet. Thasia took over from Thalmin after that. You see, the relationship between the Academy and our students has always been indicative of their relationship between the Nexus and the adjacent realms. The entire school was constructed as a bridge between the realms, after all, and after the Great War between the Nexus and the adjacent realms, there was a level of animosity and distrust that drove the Nexus to implement radical changes, at what was supposed to be neutral ground, the Academy. For you see, the Academy had long since been a centre of learning for the most magically gifted of the adjacent realms, and those usually consisted of the royalty and nobility, as it was magic that granted the first of the noble houses power to rule over the masses. So with a great concentration of the young, fleshing members of the adjacent realms elite present at the Academy, the Nexus decided to implement the academic rights as a way of directly controlling a significant portion of the upper echelons of the adjacent realms. Wait, I don't get it. How is today's ceremony not supposed to be the way it usually goes? Why do they tolerate the whole amulets or whatever that you have on? I asked at a rapid fire pace, which prompted Thamin to respond. Well, that was how it used to go, Erfrelma, but things changed. The gist of it is this. Relations improved. After we became more accepting of the Nexus's influence following the war, they became less strict about directly controlling our ruling castes. The ceremony remained as an afterthought, no longer meant to bind us, but instead kept as just tradition. Honestly, they would have just removed the rights entirely, but they kept it because they wanted to save face. They didn't want to seem weak, because if they remove it, well, it's going to look like they acquiesced to us adjacent realmers. So the rights remains, but more like a ceremony than a real rite. That's why it's normally always scheduled after orientation and arrival. It gives time for students to prepare, share amulets, and make new ones. So when the time came for the ceremony, everyone would resist it by default. It was just a show, literally just a tradition. Thurman replied, succinctly. So that's what was different about today. They literally surprised all of you by bringing back an old policy you expected to have been dead or at least nerfed for ages now, I surmised, which prompted nods of tentative affirmation from both Thaumin and Thasia. I barely had enough time to process everything, before a sharp creaking noise pierced the air, just after our discussion had ended. A small door that blended in seamlessly with the rest of the wood panelling of the living room suddenly opened up, revealing faint candlelight emanating from within. Emerging from it was a member of the same diminutive elven race that had read out my name upon entry to the Grand Hall. This one, however, seemed much more shabbily dressed, adorned in rags if they could even be called that. They seemed to be dragging out oversized suitcases and luggage, which I immediately assumed belonged to my peers. An assumption that was probably proven right as Eleanor sighed loudly upon seeing it. Just place it wherever, or less, and leave us alone when you're done, Eleanor spoke dismissively. The beam bowed deeply in response, as it seemed to be quick in grabbing more luggage and suitcases, which at this point was quickly taken by both Thaumin and Thacia, who gingerly removed them from the elf's hands, as they both spoke at the same time. That won't be necessary. They spoke with sympathy and pity in their voices. Eleanor, however, instead glared at the whole exchange, with an annoyed expression. 
The elf is here to serve. Let it serve, he proclaimed as he snapped his fingers twice. Where are your manners, Aurelus? Introduce yourself to your betters. Uh, apologies, master. I, I, I am Orin. I have been assigned as your dormitory's resident porter. If there is anything I can do, anything at all, I will be at your command throughout the day and night. The elf spoke, before bowing deeply towards each and every one of us. Thaisa and Thalman's reactions were easy enough to read. The princess was worried to show any emotion, but it was clear through those very expressive eyes that a great remorse was swelling up within her. Thalman's reactions, however, were far more confusing, as it was clear there was some level of personal shame there as if he had something to say but couldn't. Go back to your hole, we were discussing something important. Eleanor finally waved the poor thing off, as I was once again stuck there, utterly thrown off by everything. As soon as the elf was out of the room, however, I felt as if I needed to say something about that whole exchange. I simply couldn't stand by and watch anymore. This was the last straw.